Doing today's introduction is Dr. Patricia Pavier. Patricia is the group leader of the Radiological Materials Group at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. She's also the chair of the Gen 4 International Forum Education and Training Work Group. Patricia. Thank you, Berta. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening. I hope you are doing well and you stay safe. It's a pleasure today to have Mr. Frédéric Reismar from the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna with us. He is currently the team leader for SMRs in the Nuclear Power Technology Development Section. He joined the IAEA nearly seven years ago and manages, coordinates, supervises the project in this area. He provides technical and programmatic leadership by identifying key future trends in technology development needs in cooperation with member states. Before, he was head of the High Temperature Gas Cool Reactor Project. Frederick holds a master's degree in reactor science, has published more than 90 papers, has been invited as a speaker to many international workshops and conferences, and led several international cooperation projects. He is a reactor physicist by training with extensive experience in SMR and HTGR nuclear engineering and analysis with core neutronics design and safety as focus areas. He worked on the South African PBMR project in different leadership positions for 30 years. For the first 10 years of his career, he contributed to the OSCAR reactor calculation and system development and perform cycle and reload analysis. So thank you so again very much, Frédéric, for volunteering uh, to give this, this webinar with us today. Uh, without any delay, I give you the floor. Thank you again, Frédéric. Patricia, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, thank you for the interest. Um, and uh, I see we already have over 200 participants. So I'm very happy that this project are always popular. And I hope, um, uh, I think uh, many of the uh, people will hear a lot of what they heard before, but hopefully also will learn something new. So um, I think to start with uh, a question that we always ask, uh, big or small? So what should be uh, answer from the nuclear perspective on this? So if you go for breakfast, uh, would you want a, a large breakfast, a small breakfast? What would you order? And what is actually the best solution? And uh, this is not always so clear. So it really depends on what you want. Is it the advantages of economy of scale? Or should um, a deployer or vendor look at the economies of multiples? And uh, there's no real answer. It really depends on what you need. So what is the best? I think it really depends. So with that very short introduction on a lighter note, um, this is what I want to look at today. I want to a very short introduction to the International Atomic Energy Agency, then ask a question of what is small modular reactors, then focus on specific characteristics that makes them unique, um, spend a bit of time on flexible application, very shortly on the economics. It's very important, but it's not my area of expertise, but just share a few ideas with you. Then the challenges to deployment of these SMRs, and finally the conclusions. So at the IEA, um, we are really best known for the uh, safeguard function that we have. My apologies for the delay in the slides. It seems to be very slow today. Um, so HC is always in the news for our safeguard function. Uh, but of course, the agency is much more. It has been established in 1957 and currently have 171 member states. And here and at other offices, there's over 2,500 professionals and support staff from more than 100 countries 
working at the agency. I want to highlight two of the maybe less known tasks of the agency in the articles or objectives of the agency in the statute. So to seek to accelerate and enlarge the contribution of atomic energy to peace, health and prosperity throughout the world and also to encourage and assist research on and development and practical application of atomic energy for peaceful uses throughout the world. So um, the agency has six different departments. I mentioned safeguards, but there's also safety and security that's very well known, technical cooperation, nuclear science and applications in the area I'm in, in nuclear energy. And the nuclear energy that fosters sustainable nuclear energy development, uh, supporting existing and new reactor programs. We have four divisions, uh, four sections in the division of nuclear power. And I'm from the nuclear power technology development section. So the agency have several mechanisms how we support our member states. And uh, here's some of them listed just to give you an idea information exchange, especially from member states that have the knowledge to those that want to learn. We support modeling and simulation, the development of different technologies and methodologies, um, the uh, toolkits that's been developed, uh, knowledge preservation, the development of um, simulators for educational purposes and uh, technical support in general. So this is the mechanisms that we have at the agency to support member states. I thought to uh, include one example of um, how we support member states. And this is through the embarking countries that's interested in reactor deployment through the reactor, reactor technology assessment methodology that's developed, uh, supported by a toolkit. So here's some of the countries that have applied this uh, toolkit, develop our section to uh, do a, a comparison between different technologies. Uh, the agency uh, supply the methodology, give some training, but of course evaluation is up to the member state itself. And this uh, can also be applied for small modular reactors. So this is just one example. Then of course, the link with generation four with GIF, so uh, we have a close cooperation and a yearly interface meeting. The last one as a virtual meeting took place uh, just about a month ago. And uh, this is really to try and coordinate our activities in different areas to avoid duplication. So um, all the six systems that's in GIF are also uh, looked at at the agency. But there's also, of course, other areas like risk and safety work group or educational that uh, this webinar is part of and also why it's good for us from the agency to support this initiative. So that was a bit of background on the IEA. So the question now is what is SMO or small model reactors? So at the agency, we look at it as advanced nuclear power plants that produce electricity up to 300 megawatt electric and uh, it's typically individual modules that can be built in factories and transported to a site and installed as demand arises. Um, it's also uh, more importantly recently the need to have a flexible power generation uh, for a wide range of users and applications are really uh, one of the requirements that come to the fore. And then there's some areas that I will touch upon as I go through the presentation on the economics or better affordability. If you buy a, a small car compared to a big bus, uh, maybe it's not more economically to run to transport many people, but at least you can afford a small car. So the affordability, shorter construction time, site flexibility, some of these characteristics I will focus on through the presentation. So what's the current status of these small model reactors? The, um, just a moment for the slide to go forward. Um, yeah, first maybe on, on the family tree of, of SMRs. So if you look at the nuclear tree, we'll see even in the early years, a many, Many different reactors has been looked at. 
Um, there's gas good reactors or forced reactors. So all the different types of reactors, molten salt that was developed in the in the 60s. And in all cases, um, today we find small model reactors as part of this uh, uh, family tree. So for high temperature gas good reactors or for candus, or of course for water cooled reactors, molten salt reactors, in all these areas today we find small model reactors. Then uh, some of the main characteristics that I'll also look at later on, the uh, simplification by modularization and system integration, the idea to have a multi-module plant that you can deploy modules as and when they are required. There's new ideas of underground construction techniques or uh, marine based and also the enhanced safety performance, mostly through passive safety systems or passive means. So what's the status of these reactors? Good news is that uh, since uh, May this year, the uh, academic Lomas of floating nuclear power plant that have two KLT-40S reactors, two modules on board, has been in commercial operation. This is um, in the northeast of region of Russia. So that has been deployed successfully. The construction of the H2RPM in Shindo Bay has been completed and all the main components has been installed. And we expect uh, the first criticality in 2021 with commercial demonstration to follow. This is actually two units connected to a single power turbine delivering 210 megawatt electric. And then in Argentina, the CARM25, that's integral PWR design with natural circulation that will produce 27 megawatt electric is a prototype under construction. And um, um, this this project is continuing and is an important milestone for the integrated PWR design. So this is good news. Something has finally started to happen and is being pursued in different areas of the world. But then interesting, the interest. So this is SMR designs all over the world. Some of them, not even all of them, just to give you an impression of all the different types and the reactor names that's been developed. Uh, many times by small startup companies. And this is uh, information that we captured at the IEA in our RS database on advanced reactor systems. And uh, every two years we publish, uh, we call it a booklet, but it's really like a mini Bible that we publish these days, um, every two years. And uh, the 2018 edition is shown here and we're busy working on the 2020 release. Uh, where we expect to have 70 SMR designs uh, being described. And this is uh, various types of reactors from land-based, water-cooled reactors, marine-based, HDRs, fast reactors, molten salt reactors, and more and more the interest in micro-reactors are increasing. And we will also include test reactors for the first time. We also decided to add information on the fuel cycle, decommissioning and final disposal into the descriptions the first time. So if you search for IEA and RS database, you'll immediately find the link to um, the database and then under publications, one of the main tabs, you will find the previous booklets. And as I said in September, the 2020 update. And this is just to give you a bit more of impression of all the different designs from all the different regions of the world that will be in the new booklet. Of course, um, the sustainable development goals are very important today and the agency have identified uh, at least these three where the agency can make a contribution from a nuclear energy perspective. Of course, the most important is affordable and clean energy and the climate action plan but also supported by the industry. And we know from the last Paris Agreement and discussions that the role and future role of nuclear are more and more recognized and that the goal of one and a half degrees or even two degrees will be very difficult to reach if we don't include nuclear in the future deployment. 
and um, I think this graph is also well known in different forms that uh, nuclear is one of the lowest carbon producing electricity sources in the world. So I think that's at least show a uh, future potential for nuclear deployment including small modular reactors that can be included in the country plans on how they want to restrict their CO2 emissions. Um, now I just want to give uh, a bit more information on some of the designs. I will just highlight a few things but this is really all will be in the booklet. Um, for example, for land-based small modular reactors, all the different designs, this is mostly integral PWR designs. Uh, the CARM that I mentioned already, the ACP100, that should start construction soon. I think it's delayed due to the COVID um, situation. Uh, the France have uh, in last year announced the new world design that they also started to development now. The small design from Kari from Korea is well known and has in cooperation with Saudi Arabia been further developed and I think from, a use, from the US new scale is very well known that is busy with design certification and uh, want to build the first plants at Idaho Falls site um, and start construction in, in 2023 or in that time frame possible operation in 2026. So this is some of some of the designs. Then for marine based, uh, I already mentioned the KLT40 design um, that's been deployed in Russia. But here's some other examples as well. The Rhythm 200M design also from Russia that's been deployed in some of the icebreakers, the nuclear icebreakers. In China, there's idea for uh, the ACPR50S to deploy this at uh, on fixed platforms and the shell shelf design is also shown here. So this gives of, of course flexibility um, uh, for siting and so on that I will later also touch upon. Um, high temperature gas good reactor types is the next one I wanted to highlight. The uh, HDRPM that it is under construction I mentioned. Here's other designs. Um, the XE100 from the US is a forerunner for HDRs in the US. There's uh, the South African project I worked on, the PMMR for example, in Japan. They look at the uh, GT HDR300 and in the US from a tone, the uh, ACHD high temperature gas cooled reactor project. That's a quite large 625 megawatt thermal. So I give an idea of the different designs in different sizes that's under, develop under development. Then molten salt reactors, there's a huge interest in molten salt reactors. Uh, more recently, of course, there's experience in the 1960s for the experiment that was at Oak Ridge National Lab. And uh, here's also some of the designs uh, shown. Um, they, of course, as various designs, for example, the Kairos power reactor in the middle, make use of coated particle fuel in uh, pebbles and the molten salt is only the coolant but in most other designs we have a molten salt fuel that is circulated through the reactor. Um, this bring a lot of challenges but also a lot of potential advantages in future deployment. And finally the micro reactors, this is something that is growing in, in interest also, in my own opinion, could be the uh, first next wave of SMRs to be deployed because they are typically competing with diesel generators in, um, in far off regions, uh, Northern Territories, for example, that's currently very expensive and uh, this is a very good alternative. So here's also some of the designs, the Movalax Evinci design from uh, Westinghouse and the MOR design I will also later refer to. So hopefully I gave you some impression of all these different designs that's out there that's under development. And this is just a, a summary of the timeline as we see it. Of course, uh, this is going to the future, it's always unknown, but the three reactors that's uh, approaching one in operation and two approaching operations, and then some of the others, uh, construction times and potential operational times um, as we go forward. 
So the good news is there is some SMRs under development uh, and for near-term future deployments. Okay, so let's focus on some of the specific characteristics of small modular reactors. First thing is part of the name, of course, modular, really refer to a multi-module configuration. So this is to have two or more modules located at one location um, and operated from a single control room. Of course, the two could be also much larger, for example, the new scale design with 12 units where I think three or four of the units uh, can be operated by the same operator. That's a proposal. Of course, we want to reduce the staff. If we have a small reactor, we need the same number of operators. So it has to be simplified. New approaches needs to be found, for, for example, also in instrumentation and control. Um, the advantage is that these modules can be added as and when needed also from a financial point of view. Another aspect of modularization is of course the factory manufactured. So you can do it at much better conditions than on-site and the quality assurance can be much better. Uh, this can, the smaller units can be uh, transported to the site by truck or rail or barge. It should lead to faster construction um, and uh, Maybe just to say that some of these modular construction techniques, of course, is already also applied for large light water reactors. So there's a lot to learn, but if it's a simpler, smaller design, it is definitely much easier to um, achieve this in future. Something about the sites. Uh, so ISMRs promise much uh, smaller sites requirements. Uh, the main thing uh, the vendors are looking at is the emergency power, uh, the emergency planning zone. Uh, if that can be reduced, I think in the US this is probably as typically uh, 10 miles and uh, depending on, on different criteria. Um, SMR vendors want to deploy their reactors close to population centers, also close to the end user, especially if it's, for example, a process heat user then the SMR should ideally be constructed very close to these industries. So the question is how to license it, is it possible, what should be achieved? Interesting that the uh, some of the SMR currently under construction or planned um, is planned at existing sites. Of course, it makes it much easier to get the initial license, but the ultimate goal would be to deploy them at uh, green sites or at um, where existing co-power plants are no longer operating. Uh, one important factor, um, if for smaller sites and closer to, to industries and so on, is physical security. So many of the vendors also closely look at those requirements. And in the picture, just to give you an impression, I showed the uh, vocal three and four uh, sites and then the H2RPM site in China and uh, in the end, by, by a very simple comparison, I could uh, fit enough of the small reactors in the site to have the same capacity of total production. But this is not a very scientific comparison, but just to give you an idea. Then on uh, other sites, uh, other information around siting, um, underground deployment, this uh, will have better protection against the impacts of severe weather better seismic strength and also enhanced protection against the uh, fission product release and could also be increased physical security. Also by depending on the design uh, by putting an underground can also use the swirl around the reactor as the ultimate heat sink. The marine based are interesting because you are really within your intimate heat sink so the seawater more flexibility possible for uh, deployment at coastal sites and it also opened up a whole new discussion around ownership operations and so on uh, because uh, different than land-based uh, the reactor can always be towed back to the owner or the owner country so it also opens some some other interesting aspects um, I want to just for a moment stand still at the emergency power, uh, emergency planning zone, uh, why uh, the vendors believe this can be reduced. Um, 
most of the SMR designs uh, really claim a much greater safety margin, as many of the accidents can be prevented. They also make use of passive and uh, active accident prevention systems, and many of the designs have a much lower power density. Of course, just by the great, smaller uh, size and power, the overall source term is, of course, much reduced. Um, the designs can also show that the event sequence is much slower. They have a larger um, inventory of water, for example, or for HDRs, a huge core graphite mass that makes these transients very slow and it will develop over days uh, compared to maybe minutes or seconds. And therefore, it creates additional time to take actions, but also reduction in the source term due to the decay. Um, yeah, so HDRs, for example, also no core melt. So based on these um, time mitigation, smaller um, overall source term, also different nature, molten salt reactors, for example, a lot of the fission products will stay in the molten uh, salt and this uh, won't be released from it. Even if there's a leak, um, the, the vendors can motivate for the um, Regulate, regulatory um, organizations to reduce the site boundary and the emergency planning zone. Um, this is not only a plan, this is also a reality because the uh, um, TBA has actually submitted, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority has submitted such application to NRC and the NRC has agreed that the emergency planning zone for small water reactors, they had, I think, four more designs that they propose can be reduced. And in one case, uh, they agree that it's most likely that it could be on the site boundary. So a good progress already made in this area. Um, I've spoken about integral PWR and just thought it's maybe good to just demonstrate a bit more what this means and what the safety implications are. So in the middle, I show a typical uh, large uh, light water reactor with uh, four loops. And uh, the steam generators, as shown, can be integrated within the uh, vessel, um, as shown by the two examples for small model reactors. Can also take the pumps, and uh, there's two designs. So one is still external, but closely coupled. Uh, in the case of ACP100, for the smart, it's really integrated within the vessel. Um, for example, the pressurizer for SMART is part of the design. For ACP100, they chose to have the pressurizer still outside. Um, the core and RPV is, of course, part of the overall vessel. And then different options for control or drive mechanisms. By placing these within the vessel or a cap, you can, for example, uh, eliminate the control or ejection accident. So, Different designs have different solutions. Most of them um, will eliminate the large uh, loca um, by integrating the design. Also, this allows for different ways to for heat removal and um, also for containment of corium within the vessel, for example. Um, typically, also uh, a large amount of water can be supplied to ensure the ultimate uh, cooling of the reactor. Also for containment, there's different um, solutions being proposed. For example, submerged containment or new scale that's part of a bigger pool for heat uh, transfer and removal, or a steel, steel containment or traditional containment with concrete, and also different severe accident features from in-vessel corium retention to um, hydrogen management in the containment for our iris and so on. So just the flavor of how the SMO designers have uh, improved uh, the safety features of these reactors for IPWRs. And then finally, maybe a, a very powerful demonstration of this. Uh, this is a typical light water reactor safety system that required needed to protect the core. And on the next slide, I show the same list, but now for new scale. So you can see many of the safety systems um, is proposed to no longer be needed due to the integrated design and other features that was introduced. And this, importantly, uh, will lead to simpler uh, designs, less complex construction, and simplified op 
operational procedures. Okay, then I thought um, I should at least do one of the advanced reactors as well. And since I spend my life on high temperature gas cooled reactors, I thought this is a good uh, case also to show. Now, high temperature gas cooled reactors have the main characteristics that it use the coated particle fuel. Um, so this is a, a inner kernel of uranium oxide or or other material, uranium carbide or plutonium or thorium, that's encapsulated within different coated coatings. And uh, these, this design really allows for very high temperatures to be reached within this reactors in operations, but also protect uh, fission product release in accident conditions. So the main characteristics are this higher temperatures, the use of this coated particle fuel, it's thermal systems that's graphite moderated, always in this philosophy, small units for the inherent safety characteristics that I will explain shortly, uh, to be deployed as multiple modules, and very importantly, a much lower power density. So three to six watt per cubic centimeter compared to 60 to 100 watt per cubic centimeter for large light water reactors. So you can see a factor of uh, up to 30 times lower. We get two basic designs of high temperature gas good reactors. The prismatic block where this same coated particle fuel are put in pins and installed in a graphite block. And then these blocks are stacked in the fuel column and in different configurations can be a small reactor, low power or a larger one with a large inner fuel free uh, zone, depending on the power and the application that's needed. The other type is the pebble type. So in this case, again, the same coated particle fuel. In this uh, design, it's put within the inner part of a graphite sphere or ball. And these graphite spheres are inserted within the reactor cavity, the inner area of the reactor. This is a random process. They are slowly circulated um, the burn-up is measured and you can have a multi-pass system where the fuel will pass through this reactor several times before it is discarded once it's reached its target burn-up. So this is just uh, the two type of designs we have. The main benefits of the high temperature is increased efficiency if you do electricity generation. So from the say 33% for uh, water cooled reactors, it can be increased to say 42% or 45%. And if you um, do a direct cycle, this can go up to 50%. So quite a significant increase um, compared to the current reactors. Um, of course, of this high temperatures, it can produce steam uh, for petrochemical industry. And this is really important because it means this type of reactor can compete in the total energy market, not only in le electricity generation. So through cogeneration, generation uh, high temperature steam, and ultimately with a higher temperature for hydrogen production, it can contribute to uh, the large energy sector that's not currently served by nuclear. Significant improved safety. I will explain this a bit now, the natural means of decay heat removal that leads to no large release and therefore a good case to reduce the emergency powers, uh, emergency planning zone or to place these reactors close to the end users. That um, by doing this, you can also, of course, save transmission cost, and it's a requirement if you want to transport heat and reduce the losses. Um, the fuel has been tested uh, in reactors and also in test facilities to very high burn up, and uh, it's also a very good burning of plutonium if, if that's something the country will pursue to get rid of the plutonium um, in their programs. Um, so 80 to 200 gigawatt, so that's significantly larger than currently achievable in light water reactors. There's of course challenges as well. This very low power density that I say is such a good feature means that if you want to have a, a larger reactor, even a small one, such as 600 megawatt thermal, that your vessels become very large. So shown here is a vessel size for HDR of 600 megawatt thermal. And you can see two current large PWR vessels can easily fit within this. That means this component is also at high pressure 
and is expensive and definitely not easy to transport. So in this case, uh, the modular modularity is really challenged because of the large vessel. Um, of course, of the uh, low density, the helium has to be pressurized, as I mentioned. Advantage is that it's non-condensable, uh, non so uh, the traditional containment um, philosophy doesn't apply. So you have to convince your regulator about that as well. And in general, the coated particle fuel costs are expected to be higher. You can imagine if each small uh, uranium particle has to be coated compared to just uranium dioxide put into pellets, that you would expect some higher cost for this fuel. So, um, if my slide will change, I want to tell you something about the safety philosophy on hopefully only on one slide. So, we start with um, the coated particle fuel that is a uh, very good uh, retention of fission products up to very high temperatures. It's been proven to 1800 degrees and higher in the latest programs. So, this combined with all natural means of de decay heat removal. So, if um, my reactor, uh, if I lose power, for example, or offsite power, I don't need any active systems to remove the decay heat. This can be done by all natural means, by radiation convection and conduction from my fuel, through my side reflector to my vessel, and ultimately to a cooler within the cavity around my reactor. This could be a passive system, but it can also be shown even if the the system fails that just the heat removal through the concrete and ultimately to the surrounding soil is good enough to protect my fuel and therefore not to have any release. So this is shown in the graph at the bottom. So if I lose all um, cooling in the sense of no circulation of the helium, in the pressurized case, over a long time, over two days, my reactor temperature will increase to 1200 degrees. Uh, that's very low compared to where fuel will start to fail. Um, if I go to a depressurized case where I lose all my coolant as well, you'll see it's maybe uh, up to 1500 degrees. And if I also lose my safety system that's supposed to remove the decay heat, so the real ultimate case, if I remove this heat to, through the concrete to the ground, you'll see only a small increase in the temperature in the maximum here in the center of the reactor. On the left bottom is shown the release of uh, or the failure fraction of fuel as a function of temperature of these coated particles. So breaking of these uh, coatings, you'll see up to 1,800 degrees, as I said before, no significant release. And then some fuel over time might start to fail but you can see the fraction is very small. So only at very high temperatures where I expect a lot of these coated particles to potentially fail. So as long as my design is modular and the power density are limited, I can assure that my temperature will never get close to those areas where a large amount of fission products can be released. So this is really the safety case of high temperature gas cooled reactors to maintain the fission products within the fuel for all foreseeable um, accidents. So the next topic I want to look at is the flexible, flexible applications of SMRs. So of course, we talked about electricity generation already, process heat, uh, replacement of aging fossil plants. Uh, one topic that it's very interesting today is integrated with renewables. We know renewables are being deployed. It's an intermittent uh, electricity generation source. And the question is um, what should support this to ensure grid stability? And SMRs has been studied extensively to do this. Or, for example, the desalination of water is possible. So the model often look, uh, looked at, for example, here on the left, is to have my modular SMR. It uh, can do electricity generation. It can also be coupled to many different um, applications. For example, process heat for petrochemical industry, desalination, oil and gas reforming, uh, ammonia production, district heating. And I can also couple it with um, uh, thermal storage 
for example, to store some heat and to use it for these applications or electricity production later. Um, examples here of how load follow can also be used to support intermittent renewables. Many studies have been done and, and published. So um, on the coupling, oh, this is just a summary of the outlet temperature of the different uh, SMRs that's in the 2018 booklet. You can see the water cooled, of course, around 300 degrees, increase for the fast system uh, liquid metal cooled, molten salt also higher, up to 700 degrees outlet, depending on the salt used, and then high temperature gas group reactors and very high temperature reactors in future, up to 1000 degrees. Um, how to use this heat in different configurations? This is one example for co-generation with HDR, where the helium being circulated, that the higher temperature helium can be used to heat uh, through an intermediate heat exchanger, another um, fluid or helium to apply direct heat to a process. And then the lower temperatures can still be used for electricity generation. Alternatively, if you only want to use it for a high temperature application, you could uh, couple it just through intermediate heat exchanger to some process across the site boundary that make use of this heat. Um, one of the countries that have extensively looked at the use of uh, high temperature gas cooled reactors, if my slide will change, is Poland. And they looked at the chemical plants within Poland and they need up to 6,000 500 megawatt um, thermal heat of in the range of 400 to 550 degrees. So, the, so they are considering deploying HDRs in future. The idea would be, as illustrated in the picture, to replace some of the coal boilers at the end of their life with high temperature gas cooled reactors and plug into the existing system of heat supply. Um, in their studies that they did, they saw that uh, reactor of in the order of 165 megawatt thermal is probably the optimum size in Poland and looking at the market they foresee potential of 10 of these reactors for Poland maybe 100 for Europe and maybe thousands of these reactors throughout the world and some of the potential benefits that they are identified of course is a decreased dependence on fossil fuel import um, the price sensitivity to know what your cost would be, uh, also not to be dependent on in future increase of CO2 tax or other uh, environmental concerns. Um, of course, by developing and deploying to boost the economy and high added value for the industries. Um, they also plan to deploy large light water reactors and this can have synergies with the uh, electricity generation by large light water reactors and in future, the export potential. So this was some of the uh, elements and um, benefits uh, highlighted by uh, the Ministry of Energy from Poland at one of the IEA events. Then, um, uh, just uh, this is from a study that was done by the NGNP project of part of it within the uh, North American US. They did something similar and look at the market and say in the lower temperature range, they see 55 gigawatt thermal potential for mostly plutonium products. And then for plutonium plus ammonia production, higher temperatures, 65 gigawatt. So you can see this uh, potential of also a few hundred high temperature gas cooled reactors just for these markets that is already achievable today. and. Uh, so this is very important because it's really illustrating how uh, nuclear can participate in the whole energy um, area and not only electricity. I thought it's good to also include an example for a light water reactor, IPWR, the SMART, um, how this can also do co-generation. And this is a proposal to look at desalination and how to couple it, um, so to produce electricity, but also to produce fresh water. So finally, what's the benefits of these non-electric applications? Of course, better efficiency, 
because we don't only make electricity, we can use a lot of the waste heat to do other products, better use of energy in general, the flexibility by switching in and out of these, supporting variations on the grid or um, other variations on the products being used, the reduced environmental impact. Of course, if we don't pump all of this waste heat into the environment, we can save a lot of energy, we can save the environment and ultimately save a lot of money. So um, co-generation, non-electric applications, very important for the future. Of course, today already um, some co-generation is taking place, but mostly at low temperatures and uh, for specific applications. Um, just maybe to say the agency is uh, busy working on a publication to look at the options to enhance energy supply security through a hybrid energy system based on SMRs. This hopefully will be published in 2020 and this highlights some of the issues that we address in this uh, publication. So very short on economics. As I said, I'm definitely not an expert in this area, but if we look at the economics, we come back to our question, economy of scale or economy of multiples? And again, what's the best? It really depends. And of course, now there's also microreactors. So maybe there's a, there's a new dimension also for these microreactors and specific niche markets that they can fulfill. Um, some of the questions that the vendors ask is, can improved safety characteristics lead to improved economics? So we need fewer safety systems. Um, of course, these safety systems are high quality and therefore typically expensive. So can less expensive safety class, uh, high equipment, um, less of these equipment and therefore can, can money be saved by these integrated designs? and uh, with its inherent safety characteristics being used. Um, for example, for HDRs, a very low power density already lead to additional cost, and that should be somehow balanced. Uh, that's a vendor's proposal by not having some of the safety systems, for example, um, for the cooling of the reactor because of this um, heat removal through the, uh, through the reactor. So you don't need a circulator or to make sure that your helium inventory stays within the reactor because it's done by, by the natural means to remove the heat from the outside of the reactor. Cost savings can also perhaps be uh, achieved by the simplicity, the decrease of the number of safety systems, um, indirect safeties because of Public acceptance, maybe if um, reduced insurance premiums, uh, availability of sites closer to um, to communities uh, can also save some of the cost, and specifically by doing cogeneration and non-electric applications. So the benefits of SMRs also less total capital funds um, during construction period. So if the reactors is Smaller, it means less total capital, uh, not maybe the price per unit of electricity installed. But again, um, if it's much smaller, it means that maybe you need, need a tenth of the capital funding. Easier to convince an investor to provide this. Also, um, you maybe don't need government guarantees to be able to afford uh, a SMR, where the large reactors we know it's really problematic. Um, also, with simplicity, um, it should be um, not these massive projects that we know is really complex and typically runs late, um, very difficult to manage, very difficult to do the uh, project management and that leads to construction delays. So the construction time should be limited as far as possible. And um, also the idea that you can, if you have multiple units to be deployed over multiple years, that the first unit can already been operating and therefore you already start earning some money to be able to afford the later units. That also, of course, comes with questions about safety security, but at least the economy makes sense to deploy the reactors over many, many years. Here's some of the other ideas. I mentioned this capital component and the levelized cost. Um, the challenge for SMRs is to get to the economy of numbers. It needs to be deployed in large numbers. Um, 
The licensing cost is something often highlighted. So if you have to spend the same amount of money, but now you build something that's 10 times or more smaller than the large reactor, your potential revenue is much smaller. So this is something being discussed with regulators throughout the world. So I think that's enough on give you some ideas of economics. I think the main thing is that we will really only know after we have built and operated these small model reactors. So second last topic, challenges to deployment. Um, so some of the technical issues is this licensing of often first of a kind designs, particularly non light torch reactors. But even light water reactors, for example, if it use natural convection or different safety systems or integrated, also have to demonstrate to a regulator that this work potentially built experimental facilities and so on. We still have to prove its operability and maintainability. Um, how to start this multimodal plant? As I said, in principle, it has to be reduced to reduce the cost. Um, some of these designs still need research and development needs. Um, Non-technical issues, time from design to deployment, it always takes much longer than we all think. Um, of course, there's a lot of comp uh, competing uh, uh, requests for budget resources out there. Um, also, the availability of um, off-the-shelf designs for newcomers is a problem. Often the countries say, yes, we want to deploy SMR, but it needs to have been demonstrated. So since that's not the case yet, it's a waiting game for many of the newcomers to wait for one or more of these SMRs to be deployed before they can really put their plans in place. Okay, so that's some of the challenges. Um, a few others, uh, the standardization of the first of a kind engineering. We mentioned the control room. How do we staff it? How do we reduce it? A uh, question of the source term for me is multiple reactors and emergency planning zone. Uh, looking at the all the units together, how to do this, developing new methodologies around this. And for specific uh, areas, for example, natural circulation, there could be questions around the startup procedure of these integral PWRs, just as a few examples. Um, I want to, since the construction time is so uh, important and uh, really uh, can cost a lot if there's delays, I want to just show you this picture for that's interesting. What we did was uh, selected the best examples for large nuclear power plants after 1990 that was put on the grid. Um, so you'll see this is no, this is excluding some of the large reactors that unfortunately now has been long delayed. And you can see that many of them do actually achieve the target of 60 months. So it really shows it can be done. Many of these examples are with multiple plants being built on the uh, same site and therefore the uh, important learning. So they really show that's an important aspect. If we look at the free reactors and the construction, unfortunately they all will take longer and significantly longer than the 60 months. And we know many of the SMR designers wants to uh, hit this target of, of three years or 36 months. And uh, so all to say that it's clear that you have to uh, have experience, um, construction and the uh, amount of learning that can be achieved from one unit to a second is very important to be able to reduce the time to the target of the end of the kind to do it in uh, 36 months. Um, maybe final on the barriers, we talk about the um, limited near-term commercial availability. So you can't really go and look at the reactor and order it off the shelf. Um, the technology developers' ability to secure investments, uh, how to show that it will be economically competitive and how do you get to multiple units to get this uh, saving. First of a kind, uh, licensing is very difficult. Also questions around how do you prove the uh, passive safety features will work as intended. Also on the integrated systems, so often more work needs to be done and also test facilities constructed to illustrate it will work as intended. Um, of course, we know the water cooled are based on mature technology, um, especially if the design is similar. 
For HDOs, there's been some experience and it's seen as fairly mature if you stick to a steam generator and the lower temperatures. But for very high temperatures, more work, especially on materials are needed. Uh, molten salt reactors have a limited operational experience and some challenges to solve. But we see that many of the SMR molten salt reactor designers have very innovative ideas how to resolve this. I think in the end, we really need government support. And I think there's been good news recently already with many governments that are actually supporting the uh, SMR development. I thought just to show one example with the Can Canadian um, SMR roadmap, they have attracted many of the SMR and microreactors designers to participate in their pre-licensing. So this is a list from their website that you can have a look at. And um, this also has led recently to the first uh, application of a SMR for a license, site license in Canada. So Global First Power, supported by Ontario Power Generation, UltraSafe has made an application for the Chalk River Ontario site to deploy a first demonstration unit of the MMR 50 megawatt thermal, 5 megawatt electric, electric uh, high temperature gas cooked reactors. So currently the environment impact assessment is already underway. Uh, many other countries, the US, uh, UK, other countries are also supporting SMR deployment. So that's critical. I thought to close with um, this very well-known uh, quote of the Rickover, Rickover effect. And uh, this is to say that a paper reactor or a new concept are really simple, small, cheap, and lightweight. Of course, it can be built very quickly. It needs little development, and we really just take off-the-shelf components and put it together. But we know in real life, um, reactors are complicated, they are large, they are heavy. They will be built now, they're behind schedule, requires a lot of resources um, uh, to solve even trivial items. It takes a long time to build, because of engineering development problems. So with this, uh, may we not uh, stay with paper reactors for SMRs, but uh, also continue beyond paper reactors and uh, make it a reality. So in conclusion, SMRs are really a big wave that uh, of ever increasing interest and promise. Uh, it's an attractive option for newcomer countries with smaller grids and less developed infrastructure, also a smaller purse. Uh, for advanced uh, countries for power supplies in remote areas or specific applications, they are uh, innovative concepts. They have uh, many common technology development challenges, including regulatory and licensing frameworks. They are designed to be more flexible, could be used on demand, carbon-free electricity generator in grid systems that contain large percentages of intermittent renewable energy. The potential impact is not only for electricity, but also non-electric applications to serve the large energy market. And we really need more demonstration units to come online to endure SMR becomes a reality. Um, the good news is we have the forerunners of SMRs being deployed today and we have many designs and may they, many of them be converted from paper to concrete. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, if you have questions, we have several questions in the question pane, but if you have questions, go ahead and type those in now. Uh, while those questions are coming in, we'll just take a quick look at the upcoming webinar presentations that we have scheduled in August, MSR safety evaluation in the U.S., in September, maximizing clean energy integration, the role of nuclear renewable technologies in integrated energy systems, in October, global potential for small and micro reactor systems to provide electricity access.
Okay, so Frederick, I don't know if you can see the questions pane. Um, the first question that we have uh, in that list of growing questions is, will there be need for accident tolerant fuel for SMR? What is the expected cost of generating electricity in SMR? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I can see it now actually popping up before I couldn't see it. But just so I, when I was about to tell you, I can't see it. <laughs> I can see it. Um, <laughs> so um, I think some of the uh, SMR designs already incorporate um, what maybe will be called accident tolerant fuel. Um, for example, the high temperature gas cooled reactors, as I explained, and I think the molten salt reactors will make the same claims. Um, so, accident tolerant fuel typically uh, refer to the enhancements on current fuel to uh, make them less prone for for melting. Um, so, as far as I know, uh, many of these margins of uh, or been achieved by other safety characteristics, for example, lower power density, the availability of water, the integrated uh, PWR designs. Um, so I don't think specifically they say they need excellent tolerant fuel. I think some of the vendors might be looking at it, especially if it's successfully deployed in large light water reactors. I'm sure many of the SMR water cooled reactors will also consider consider that. On the cost of electricity generation, as I really said, it depends. Uh, the potential are really there for um, many reactors being deployed for the cost to come down. I think currently, um, I think the vendors will claim mostly uh, maybe equivalent cost or similar to current large reactors, but I think initially it will be very difficult to achieve. Because the only way really to achieve this is by this economy of numbers, and therefore more SMRs will have to be built to bring the cost down compared to large light water reactors. So I think in the end it's maybe achievable, but I think it's more the other features, uh, adaptability to the market. Um, today also the cost or the income of a electricity generator are not really only based on its uh, ability to provide electricity, but also on things, for example, to do load follow, get paid extra for that. So I think with these additional features of SMRs, um, it's, they can uh, have additional sources of income and therefore compete in future within the energy market. Thank you. Um, so I've had some feedback that the handouts did not download from um, the handouts pane. If you click on those, those should should be able to download directly to your um, laptop or your computer where you're at. If those do not download, I apologize. I'm not sure what that technology uh, limitation is today. Uh, they will be posted when we post this recording um, on the GIF uh, the GIF website. Those the PDF of the hand of the presentation, the slide deck will be available to download there. Um, apolog I apologize again if that does not download as intended from the download pane directly today. Um, we have several questions uh, regarding the safety features of SMRs. The first question is, um, if you could please elaborate what might happen for a single control room that is used for multiple units at one site that might be damaged or not usable by, under uh, certain circumstances, are there any precautionary measures that could be taken? Yeah, um, maybe I will comment on it. It's not my expertise area, but uh, from the current regulations, it's always the need to have an um, alternative control room for the main safety features that's needed. So I think it's already something in, uh, that's in place for uh, large uh, light water reactors. Um, of course, if uh, multiple reactors are now being uh, controlled from a single control room, um, the same will apply that these alternative uh, control centers or control rooms that might have limited um, functionality to monitor and, um, for example, to shut the reactor down, that will still be required. Uh, maybe just to mention that uh, there is some examples of uh, current uh, two-unit uh, large 
three actors that already share control room. So I think there's already uh, some um, experience on, on the potential for multiple reactors from one control room. Great, thank you. To have passive safety following LOCA is a way better than eliminating a LOCA. I, sorry, the question is um, regarding passive safety following a LOCA, is it better than eliminating LOCA? And I apologize, I don't know what the acronym is. Yeah, this is the uh, loss of coolant accident. Thank you. Um, so it's it's not so clear. I mean, um, it a designer do an integral design with specific safety features. So um, specific actions can be taken to alleviate a, a loss of coolant accident. Um, com combination of active and passive features. Um, I think generally. Uh, many of the SMR designers uh, wanted to use more passive features, um, but to really just make a, a statement about if it's better to have a passive safety features after the fact of a, a local versus um, preventing in a large local altogether, I think that's really design dependent and is a design philosophy and safety philosophy from the vendor, and there's no clear, easy answer to that. Thank you. I'm going to bundle three of them together, so bear with me and then I'll post them. Um, the first is, why has Germany had poor safety experience with HTGRs? Um, could you please elaborate what might happen with the spent fuels in HDTR? Uh, does the country need special disposal? And it would be nice to highlight the extent to which some of these foreign models are incorporating safety or safeguards by design. And could you review that? That that makes it a big chunk. I apologize, Frederick. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that's fine. So let's start with the German experience with high temperature gas cooled reactors. Um, I think the the experience of the Germans, of course, are very valuable today because that means it's lessons learned for the new designers to prevent some of the uh, difficulties that the German program had. Um, maybe the first to say that the small test reactor that the Germans constructed, the AVR, although it had some um, some incidents, um, it did operate for 21 years quite successfully with a very high availability factor and also at very high temperatures doing several safety demonstrations and so on. So I think it's more referred to to the THTR that was a large reactor, it was not a SMR. So it was really a very large reactor um, constructed. Um, and it was in the late 80s and before it uh, was able to go critical, Chernobyl happened and there was a stricter safety criteria imposed on the THTR that that caused some of the problems that's probably well known. Um, I'm not going to elaborate too much, but maybe just to say, for example, the uh, THTR had a secondary shutdown system that was control rods that's inserted within the pebble bed, uh, part of the reactor, so within the fuel. Uh, this was no, never intended to be um, driven into the pebble bed by design, but after the uh, after the Chernobyl uh, accident, that was a new requirement and it had to, to be demonstrated. That, for example, caused some of the pebbles to have broken. You can imagine if you drive a, a multimeter long uh, stainless steel control rod within the pebble bed. Um, um, so that's, for example, one of the problems uh, that was caused and uh, um, that breaks some of the fuel. So the lesson learned from that, for example, is that all the designs today of pebble bed will not have any shutdown systems within the pebble area or the fuel area, but all is done from the from the reflector area. So, um, of course, a mixed bag for Germany, but I think the main thing is that this is known and a lot of lessons can be learned from, from the um, program. On the spent fuel, of course, the coated particle is a very good form for the final disposal of this fuel. Uh, because all these features to keep the fission products inside during normal operation accidents, of course, is as true for the long-term disposal of it. Some of the um, um, waste disposal in different countries want to minimize the volume, 
and therefore they might want to separate it. That's also possible and has been demonstrated on a small scale. On If you need something special, of course, I think the form of the fuel is different. So you need to have uh, different solutions, different packing um, of, of either in the intact form or either in a volume reduction mode. If you want to, for example, remove all the graphite. So this will be different. And I think the most important and the lesson learned from Germany is that this should be planned for when you do your planning for your final waste disposal. So simple example, uh, the amount of carbon-14 uh, because of the graphite, that limit might be exceeded if they wanted to store all the graphite, for example, in the final waste disposal. Not that it's a dangerous level, it was just set very low because only light water reactors was in mind. So yes, you have to adjust some of your programs to accommodate HDRs. And uh, the most important is to plan initially also and incorporate high temperature gas good reactors as for part of your fuel disposal and um, uh, project. Um, the safeguard by design. Um, yeah, this is this is not my area of expertise. Maybe just to say that the agency has an active program promoting this to look at the safeguards as part of the design. Um, of course, it's much better to include it in the design and in the building layout uh, to accommodate safeguards and the agency's function on safeguards. For example, to give access to um, to in instruments or access to uh, cameras and to make that integral part of the design. It's much better than to uh, to fit it after after the fact. This also includes things like say. Uh, dry storage, just to make the uh, dry storage cask to already accommodate some of the specific needs for the agency, for example, to put their um, seals onto it. So um, there's an active program and uh, I know some of the SMR vendors has been in contact with um, our safeguards group that's looking at the specific aspect. Thank you. Well, we have a question that refers back to slide 37, um, where there's a footprint comparison between a large reactor and an SMR. Maybe um, I will just quickly. Okay, I can recall it. Um, I can just quickly go to slide 36, 35, 36. Hopefully that's the um, the slide. I think it's a, the, pre the previous one with the uh, HDR that I tried to fit into the two large light water reactors. That uh, no, then it's 37. I guess yeah, 37. Two down. Sorry. One more. That's a that's a great one, I believe. Okay, so so the question I can see it is really to um, I did now for HDRs, and the question is for 20 new scale units, uh, 20 times 60 is 1,200. How will it compare? I think it will compare more favorably because the uh, HDR is uh, two units uh, plant that I used to to uh, make the comparison. Um, I know the Chinese are also working, INET is also working on a six unit plant that will make it 600 megawatt. And that of course will be more compact than three times two. So I'm, I'm quite sure, I haven't done the comparison that the new scale will be uh, relatively even smaller because of the much higher um, power density of the reactor, more compact design with 12 reactors in a single pool. So uh, already the standard design um, will be more compact than the HDR. So I think it will compare even more favorably. But uh, I think it's easy to make the comparison 
to look at the sizes and uh, I mean I took two I basically use um, Google Maps and look at the sizes and made the comparison in a very simplistic way. Thank you. As Is there any reason that the um, Japanese HTTR was not mentioned? I did mention one of the designs, so uh, and they have the prismatic design. So um, um, I, I recall that I did mention actually the JAA design. So it is definitely Great. one of the slides. So no reason, the important player. What does it take for a reactor technology to go from conceptual design phase to a detailed design? Does the IAEA have a document that sets out convention for talking about design on maturity? Um, we actually have a very high level document that incidentally we are currently reviewing. So we actually had a, have a virtual meeting today and tomorrow that I participated in where these questions were raised. Um, of course, it's it's very difficult to define it, and the agency are always careful to stay with generic definitions. Um, of course, the vendors have other mechanisms um, also available in industry, like technology le uh, readiness levels that they can use. So the agency don't prescribe anything specifically. Uh, we have this document, and you'll see also in the SMR booklet uh, the vendors decide themselves or they're in concept design or basic design. But I think from the uh, level of documentation available, also the status of possible applications to uh, regulators, um, there is always a way to find out what's the real level of development of these reactors. So, um, so we don't have specific um, documents on, about this, but uh, as I said, we are updating a tech doc that is currently available um, just to refresh it with new definitions and beyond this it's really up to the normal technology readiness uh, levels that's been defined by industry and by the financing uh, banks and so on out there. Great, thanks. In your opinion, do you think it would be possible to uh, couple SMRs with hydrogen production in order to decrease final cost? Yes, I think it's uh, technically feasible. Um, the Japan was mentioned. Uh, this is the main focus of their program. Um, also, the HTTR um, is got a license to start operating again after Fukushima. That's very good news. And within the program, uh, the next two major steps will be to demonstrate the gas turbine and then to do a coupling with uh, the hydrogen process. So they have done research on hydrogen processes at high temperatures for many years. And uh, this is a demonstration they want to achieve in the next um, maybe 10, 15 years. So I think it's, um, it is feasible, um, but of course we need a demonstration of this. There's a different question about which of the hydrogen processes are more efficient or what will be deployed in the short term versus long term, but um, that's not my area of expertise. Thank you. Um, based on your experience in communication with member states, what PWR land-based SMR reactor is going to be brought from paper to concrete first in the nearest future? That's a question I should not answer as IEA, but I think uh, it's clear from, from the <laughs> presentations I make that which ones are more mature and what level of uh, licensing they are already. So I think uh, people can look at that and make their own conclusions. Thank you. Um, there's a comment regarding existing utilities do not seem to be very aggressive in implementing SMRs. Is it possible for SMRs to compete economically with renewable energy and what technology or institutional in innovation is most important for that? Yeah, this is uh, difficult to answer uh, because it's a uh, it's not a technology base, it's really a market, uh, a question on the market and affordability. Um, I think we're trying to, uh, to at least highlight some of the um, aspects around it. For example, this publication of the SMR on hybrid systems. So um, the one area that from the interest we see in member states are really 
this um, use of SMRs with, uh, in a hybrid energy system. Of course, they will compete with things like large scale storage, battery storage, um, but um, there's definitely a potential future for SMRs to be deployed as the uh, percentage of intermittent renewables increase and something is needed to stabilize the grid. We know some countries talk about zero carbon and by 2050. That means the current solutions that's uh, typically uh, gas-fired um, open cycle uh, that's that's doing this load follow if um, the wind stop blowing or the sun goes behind the, the clouds, that those solutions may no longer be uh, available or be uh, attractive and uh, they think definitely SMRs, they have a potential. I think there is, um, from the Balkan countries, there's a lot of interest in the SMRs. I think for the large vendors, uh, after large utilities, of course, they are already in the market of large nuclear and uh, may not be interested in the short term. But on the other hand, the uh, new scale project is supported by a consortium of small utilities in the US. So I think there is already some interest. And I think as soon as something is uh, deployed and demonstrated, they will become more interested. I think they they will not be interested in things that's only been deployed in 10 years time. But once it's demonstrated, I think the interest will grow. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about the expected operational life cycle of SMRs compared to full scale type Gen 4? Will it be less or will it be more? Um, I'm not sure if I understand. You say life cycle? Operational life cycle? Um, operational life cycle. So maybe the first the first uh, part of the answer, I'm not sure if I fully understand it, is that the uh, of course many of the SMRs are from the generation four family. So um, of course if I only talk about um, integrated PWRs that's similar to the current uh, large light water reactors, um, operating life cycle, I'm not sure if it re uh, refers to the uh, the life of the reactor or the fuel cycles. Um, so I, th I think for the SMRs that's of the generation four type, it will probably be the same um, as the as those designs. It's the same inherent technology. Um, I know, for example, HDRs don't claim, for example, the 80 year plant life. They talk about maybe a 40 year plant life due to graphite limitations. Um, molten salt reactors, uh, some of them talk about replacement of components after six years or eight years because of possible corrosion and other reasons for um, do not want to treat the salt, for example, and want it to decay. So I think there's different models within the SMRs and not only one single uh, outlook. Thank you. Um, do you have any thoughts on steps to convince regulators to the reduce the EPZ to the plant boundary? I think the I think I already demonstrated that there has been some success already. Uh, the agency also um, has a uh, collaborated or co coordinated research project ongoing. Um, we actually have a meeting next week uh, for this project. We uh, currently we have 20 different organisations participating in looking at different aspects. So what methodology can be used? Uh, how to uh, look at the source term? Um, how it's for different technologies? So I think a lot has already been done, and it's also part of what the SMR Regulators Forum that's been uh, facilitated by the agency. This is regulators that comes together. Also, if you search SMR Regulators Forum, you'll get some information on the IEA website. So this is also a topic they've been looking at. So I think um, I think they're open for this proposal. And uh, if you look look at the mechanistic source term and calculating the dose for different accidents and have a good methodology, then it's definitely possible to um, to convince regulators that it can be reduced in size. There's of course questions about just the philosophy or principle of say last level of uh, defense and depth. Um, if you still need a, a planning of um, of evacuation beyond the zone and, and what you should do. 
but that's um, also under discussion. Thank you. Um, lots of lots of accolades coming in. So thank you for your marvelous presentation. Uh, perhaps uh, another factor con to consider is the sustainability of the nuclear industry. Obviously, building SMRs would be good for the nuclear industry manufacturing taken to the extreme. One might suggest building micro SMRs, 10 uh, megawatts or less, but that might become impractical, impractical for utilities uh, needing to generate capacity of 1,000 megawatts or more and likely will want to build 110 megawatt units. Uh, somebody had asked for a definition of micro reactors. Is that parenthetical in the comment that I just posted a, an adequate and an accurate definition to use? Um, Sorry, I that was really long, I know. Um, okay, I, I'm not sure if I see the question, but let's, from what you asked me, um, the sustainability. So uh, I think uh, many member states see this as a potential opportunity to um, to develop the industries. Um, I've mentioned uh, Canada that has the SMR roadmap, the UK that have definitely ideas to um, to use the industries to manufacture and export. There's also other countries, for example, Ukraine that have established uh, industry that's looking to cooperate with one of the SMR vendors and really to, to be able to support um, supply chain and manufacturing. Part of the reason is because of smaller vessels, simplified design, that the belief is that more, um, more uh, technology developers can actually achieve this and not only, for example, a very large vessel where there's only a few uh, plants in the world that can manufacture it. So by simplified smaller components, that uh, more industries can participate in the nuclear uh, manufacturing. On the micro reactors, I think initially it's really focused on niche markets. There's ideas for the Northern Territories of Canada, for example, um, for uh, isolated communities uh, that's running currently diesel generators that have to be trucked in on uh, ice roads, for example, or even flown in by helicopter. That's really expensive and therefore I think there's a potential that even uh, initial or second uh, unit can be financially or cost effective uh, already. Um, there's also mining in these areas that needs heat and uh, electricity. Um, on the def question of the definition of microreactors, that's something the agency has not clearly defined. Uh, we think about maybe less than 10 megawatt electric but there's probably not only size, but also things like um, the behavior or the operation of the microreactor. So it should be fairly independent of operator actions and uh, the need for operator to closely monitor. So more self-control, maybe uh, distance um, control, um, different instrumentation. And in these small designs, you can also build in more uh, inherent feedback effects. Um, so that's something we did plan a, a meeting on microreactors this year, but it's been postponed due to COVID to next year. And as I said, there's a lot of interest. Um, other applications could be, for example, backup for a um, IT center for a, a uh, um, for uh, uh, yeah that uh, that currently uh, uh, have servers and so on. So these small niche markets currently foreseen. So I can't think that uh, currently there's ideas that uh, utility will really deploy thousands of these small ones. But yes, we don't know. If it's really modular, it's easy to operate, then it becomes like batteries that you just plug together. So I don't know, but uh, maybe that's not excluded. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, there's a comment question about Russian floating SMRs supplying district heating with smaller EPZ. This could this be an important SMR application in some countries? Yeah, also, uh, as I mentioned, the KLT-42 units is already deployed in Russia. In future, they plan to deploy either the uh, RITM-200 or there's also a RITM-400 design on these floating platforms. Um, I mentioned the flexibility to be able to, uh, to deploy this at uh, more potential sites. 
there's of course a lot of questions uh, how to transport it there international waters who's responsible for what uh, legal issues that has to be sorted out um, but this is definitely one of the future areas with great potential um, also for ownership models and operation uh, models for especially for newcomer countries thank you i feel like some of these questions we've already posted perhaps people are reposting them thinking that we haven't addressed them um oops so if i post this one um i think we've already talked about the pmr land base msr will it be brought to paper or concrete in the near future yeah i also um, see one of the comments is on the on ontario um is it now i lost it um in canada definitely also interest from the uh but i did mention in my presentation ontario power generation that's committed to participating in the smr deployment in chalk river um i didn't add this to the answer of if utilities are interested but it was in my slides okay um Do you have, can you, can you see the entire questions pane? Um, I as I so. scroll through here, there are, there are, you can see the ones that, that are checkmarked that we've already addressed. There are so many questions here. We are a half an hour into the Q&A session. I, um, you know, at the, at the risk of taking too much of your time, can you scroll through those maybe and see some that you have not addressed? Um, as I said, some of them I seem see. to be repeated. Here's a question about a possible improved public acceptance of SMRs. Um, this, of course, is very tricky. Um, we all know about not in my backyard effect, uh, but there's also um, the opposite effect that uh, communities that is close to current nuclear power plants are benefiting from that are really very positive about the uh, nuclear power plants as a provider of um, of work of course of livelihood but also often because of the taxes they pay to the local uh, community or to local authorities a um, lot of benefits in the sense of um, facilities being provided so I think um, yes, because SMRs should be deployed closer to uh, public centers. Um, for example, uh, I mentioned Poland. They have a lot of large uh, industry currently. You still uh, a few of the large industries left in Europe, where most other industries have been exported to other countries due to uh, carbon impact and so on. So if that can be maintained by deploying, say, HDRs and providing the heat, reducing the footprint. Um, I know in Poland, depending on the region, there's uh, a lot of support for nuclear. And uh, so I think this could help in the end on public acceptance. Also, um, simplify designs closer to the community. So I think once it's deployed, then the positive effects will be felt. Thank you. Uh, gosh, there's just so many there. There's a question on HDGR in case of loss of power. Uh, just the natural con convection inside the core cannot remove the decay heat and transfer the steam to the generator. Um, there's just so many so i can quickly answer that uh, hopefully my uh, slide on that was clear enough um, so the i will say all the hdr's designs and the consideration today um, really don't assume any helium is needed to uh, for the heat removal function so even the loss of of the not only active cooling but also the loss of the coolant meaning the helium that um, the heat transfer just from the fuel to the side reflector to the vessel and then by radiation and convection out to the a cooler or as I said to the concrete structures that's enough to keep the temperatures low enough that there's no coal or fuel damage 
and therefore that no no active systems are needed to protect the fuel. There's discussions on this cooling panel against the wall. Yeah, that can be important for uh, the future life of the plant to make sure the vessel is not heated beyond its uh, its limits for operation. So it's not an accident issue. It's more uh, often called investment protection aspect. So to make sure you can continue operation in the case of such a rare event. So um, the coolant is really not needed. There's no need to um, transfer heat to the steam generators. It's all done by this natural heat uh, removal to the outside, outside of the reactor to the coolant, uh, to the cooler uh, reactor cavity cooling system. Um, yeah, I think that's a good explanation. Thank you. Um, and then we have one on the turbine. How is the turbine scaled with the number of modules? Um, there's different uh, models out there. I think it's not always known that there's a lot of uh, small turbines and uh, out in the industry for cogeneration. So if you look for a 25 megawatt electric turbine, you could probably buy something off the shelf that's already quite good and efficient. Um, but there's different des design decisions taken. For example, the H2RPM in China have the two units, each with its own steam generator, coupled to a single power turbine. Um, and for the six units, they will couple it to, again, to only one power turbine. So um, six reactors will feed a single power turbine. Where other designs, like for example, a new scale have a one-to-one -one relation between the reactor units and the power generation. Um, so of course, the bigger you go, uh, higher temperature, the better efficiency. But depending on what your target market and what you want to achieve with flexibility and so on, it could be better to have smaller individual power turbines. But it's surprising to see the, what's available in the market already in the smaller sizes. Thank you. Probably in that same theme, have you any information about the applicability of sub 30 megawatt SMRs with the advanced electricity grids in Europe, USA, Africa, et cetera? Reasons? include avoidance of battery storage for intermittent renewables and productive use lo locally of heat, which is hard to transport? Yeah, I'm not sure about the 30 megawatt specifically, but this uh, put it within the scope of what I mentioned for uh, micro reactors with specific um, applications within uh, these niche markets. And as I mentioned, I know some of the data centers, that's the word I was looking for, uh, already at least have looked at uh, micro reactors to uh, uh, basically to um, supplement the reliability of um, many of them have moved to renewable energy uh, with batteries, but they need something if um, something goes wrong for a week, for example, if the wind doesn't blow for a few days, then they need the uh, on-demand power supply. And some of them has been looking at micro reactors to provide this. I think in many markets with small electricity grids, um, for example, I see South Africa mentioned here or other parts of Africa, um, of course, this can make a huge impact. Uh, South Africa currently have a shortage of electricity generation and in parts of Africa, there is, for example, uh, electricity only available for a few hours. So we didn't discuss that, but there's a real need for electricity generation in general uh, outside the mature markets. And the SMRs can definitely play a role. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps one last question on uh, what is the EPZ of mobile micro reactors? Could there be no EPZ for mobile micro, micro reactors with the distributed micro reactors? Uh, will they be popular in the future? I think this is one of the design goals, but um, I'm not sure if any of the micro reactors has been successful. Um, but I think the idea would be that there's no, basically a side boundary or outside of the building will be the restriction um, for these designs. But again, it will be dependent on the power and also the specific design solution being proposed. Are there any specific impediments in selecting direct cycle for HTGRs? Um, 
impediments. Um, yeah, I, uh, I worked on a design where we looked at the direct cycle. Um, I think, okay, this is now already 15 years ago. Um, and the size that we are looking at PMR was quite challenging to design such a direct uh, helium turbine, especially at the temperatures at 900 degrees and above. So I think it's it's possible more design and demonstration work is needed. Um, and specifically on the material selection and lifetime of the blades of, of the uh, helium gas turbines. Of course, it's a very attractive future solution because of the uh, high efficiency. Could be f up to 50% of electricity generation. So I think it's something that should be pursued, but uh, I don't think it's something available off the shelf currently. Thank you. We are now um, just about 45 minutes into the Q&A, uh, there are still just so many questions left in the in the questions pane. If we did not get to your question, um, I propose that maybe uh, we try to post some answers. I'll send them uh, a transcript to uh, Dr. Ritzma and perhaps he could be gracious enough to, to propose answers. We could post them online. Um, I think as many are in these they continue to scroll in we could we could we would just be here for for so much longer and we've taken so much time already um if that's a if that's a a good compromise on addressing questions um his email is in the is in the meet the presenter slide if you have questions directly for him um but i think with that um thank you so much for the effort that you've put forth in in putting this tremendous presentation together and for everyone who's stuck with us for this, uh, we're almost two hours into, we're just short of two hours into a presentation uh, with still over 200 people online. Um, so you can see there's just a tremendous amount of interest in this topic. Patricia, thank you very much. It was a pleasure and I'm very happy that we had such, such a big audience. And um, this, I believe, is really something for the future. It uh, creates a lot of interest with the young generation and uh, the agency uh, is also here to support the interest from the member states. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much again, uh, Frédéric. It was a great presentation and a great turnaround. Thank you to the audience to stay with us for almost two hours. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. <laughs>